It is the mid 18th century, in the untamed frontier wildlands of the North American continent. The British and the French compete vigorously for domination of the region north of the Ohio River between French controlled Canada in the colony of New France and the British controlled 13 colonies along the eastern Atlantic seaboard. The two countries are not in a shooting war, but in a cold war of colonial expansion and empire building that constantly threatens to get hot on a global scale. With colonies in Africa, Asia, and the New World, the two world powers are bound to collide somewhere. From 1740 to 1748, the British and French had fought one another in their respective allies, Austria and Prussia, in the War of the Austrian Succession. The war had been fought across a wide swath of the world from the plains of Europe to the mountains and forests of North America to the waves of the high seas. However, the peace achieved in the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle, signed on October 18, 1748, did nothing to solve the growing power struggles between Britain, France, Austria, and Prussia. Internal external factors would eventually lead to a diplomatic revolution in which Austria and Prussia would reverse their respective alliances to France and Great Britain. Conflict is bound to resume, it is just a matter of when and where. Unbeknownst to the great powers at the time, the next major war would not break out in Europe as had been the trend for the past half century. Instead, the seeds of what would become the first true world war will instead be sown in the frontier forests of the Ohio Valley in North America. Along with Canada, the French controlled lands in the west and down the Mississippi River as far south as Mexico. They're using the Ohio Valley's rivers to connect their possessions, him in the British colonies, and eventually push the British off the continent altogether. By 1749, the French had sent troops in the Ohio Valley to build strategic forts along its rivers. As French influence grows, the British become increasingly worried. They want the Ohio Valley for themselves. An editorial in a Boston newspaper declares that if the British do nothing to stop this encroachment, the French will eventually lay a solid and lasting foundation for making themselves masters of America. When the stories of French atrocities reached the colony of Virginia in January of 1754, Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie sends a small force under command of Captain William Trent north to build a fort at the confluence of the Allegheny, Ohio, and Monongahela rivers, known as the Fork of the Ohio, located near present-day Pittsburgh. The Virginians barely begin construction when the French soldiers force them out of the area and begin building their own fortification which they named Fort Duquesne in honor of the Marquis Duquesne, Governor General of New France. Lieutenant Governor Dinwiddie immediately ups the ante, concerned about the British settlements and his investments in the Ohio Company that facilitates those settlements, he decides to send another force marching north made up of colonial troops. To command this force known as the Virginia Regiment, Dinwiddie selects 22-year-old George Washington, a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia Militia who has never before seen combat. Dressed in a red British officer's uniform with white lace cuffs, riding breeches, black boots, a tri-cornered hat, and with a silver gorget around his neck, Washington stands an impressive 6 feet 2 inches tall. The only military training he has received comes from his constant reading of military text. He is, however, familiar with the Ohio Valley. He had helped survey the area when he was 18. In addition, he had traveled to the area the previous November to deliver a letter from Dinwiddie to French officers on the north bank of the Allegheny River at Fort LaBeouf. On April 2nd, 1754, Washington starts off from Alexandria, Virginia, with over 133 men mustered in the Virginia Regiment. His mission is to build forts and roads until reinforced by Colonel Joshua Fry, who will join him, take command, and complete the work. The recruits, candidly described by Washington as loose, idle persons that are quite destitute in house and home, have been promised an equal share of 200,000 acres of land in the Trans-Allegheny for their trouble. The journey north is arduous. At one point, the calm is able to traverse only 20 miles in 15 days. On April 20th, when he reaches Wills Creek, Washington learns that Captain Trent has been forced from the area by the French, and that the Fort Trench's men are supposed to be building has been replaced by Fort Duquesne. Nevertheless, Colonel Washington decides to push on alone. On 
On May 24th, the Virginians reached the Great Meadows, which Washington calls a charming field for an encounter. The well-known meeting site, 50 miles north of Wills Creek, is flat and open, nestled between two ridges. Two small streams connect in the meadow, providing ample drinking water for his men. Washington decides to make camp and await developments. Four days later, Washington receives word from the Mingo Native American chief Tana Grisson, also known as a Half King, that a French spying party is concealed just west of the Virginians. Reacting quickly, Washington gathers 40 men and leads them west along a narrow trail. After hiking three miles in pitch black darkness and pouring rain, he meets up with the Half King, who shows him the French camp. Washington confers with the native chief and decides to attack. The French are encamped at the bottom of a ravine. The group of 33 men are preparing breakfast and have not mounted a guard. Some are not even dressed. Their arms are either stacked or leaning against rocks. Utilizing the high ground, Washington has his men and the Indian reinforcements encircle the camp. Whoever fires the first shot, French or English, is disputed, but the results are not. It is a slaughter. Washington's men fire a musket volley. The French, according to Washington, ran to their arms and fired briskly, but they are surrounded and caught off guard and cannot react quickly enough. The skirmish on May 28, 1754, known to history as the Battle of Jumonville Glen, lasts only 15 minutes. After the two volleys from Washington's men, the French throw down their weapons and run to the rear, but upon encountering the Indians, turn around and rush toward the Virginians to surrender. Ten Frenchmen have been killed, one wounded, and one escapes. 21 others are captured. The wounded French commander, Joseph Coulon de Villiers, the Sir of Jumonville, calls to Washington and shows him his orders, which says he is on a mission of surveillance, not engagement. As the letter is being translated, the half-king runs up to Jumonville and says in French, Thou art not dead yet, my father. He then raises his tomahawk and brings it down hard, splitting open Jumonville's skull. He then reaches into the gaping wound and scoops out a handful of Jumonville's brain and scalps him. As if on cue, the other Indians are beginning killing the wounded Frenchmen and brandishing their blades to peel the scalps off the dead. Washington, whose first military action has been a surprising success, is completely taken aback by the Indians' war practices. He knows all about scalping. It is a common practice among some whites as well as the Indians, but he has never seen it take place so close. Any romantic dreams of glory from war Washington may have harbored vanishes with the brutal death of Jumonville. Colonel Washington has another concern. He has just conducted an act of war. Jumonville's letter, which simply declares that the British should lead the area, has a marked similarity to the letter he has delivered to the French six months earlier, when he was on a mission of peace. The letter is received, but the messengers are now dead and scalped except for one Frenchman who is now making his way back to Fort Duquesne to report their atrocity. Despite the confusion, Washington has survived his baptism of fire at Jamonville Glen. He had stood exposed to fire while French shots sell past him, yet kept his cool. He later writes to his brother John of the experience, I have heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. He gathers his men, the prisoners, and their equipment and heads back to the Great Meadows. He realizes, however imperfectly, they have stirred up a hornet's nest. The French will retaliate once a lone survivor informs his superiors of the massacre. Back at camp, Washington puts his men to work constructing a fort in the meadow. Meanwhile, he sends his prisoners south to Virginia under small guard. The rest of the men begin splitting timbers and sinking them into the ground, making a circular wall with pointed tips. Inside, they build a small wooden storehouse covered with bark and animal skins to keep dry the powder, supplies, and the barrels of rum. Major Robert Stobo names the fortification Fort Necessity in honor of our empty bellies. Around the base of the fort, the men dig rifle pits. While the fort takes shape, Colonel Washington learns that reinforcements from Alexandria will not be reaching him immediately. He also gets word on June 6th that Colonel Fry, who's supposed to replace him as commander, has died in a horse riding accident, making Washington the highest ranking officer in the area. 
He is cheered when reinforcements reach his camp on June 9th, bolstering his numbers to almost 300 men and 9 swivel guns. Small cannons capable of firing solid or grape shot from 100 to 200 yards. Five days later, a regular British army unit made up of 100 men in all from a South Carolina independent company of foot marches into camp. However, a problem ensues when their commander, Captain James McKay, tells Colonel Washington that since his commission comes directly from the Crown, he will take command. Washington politely refuses the order, explaining that there's no difference between provincial and regular army rank. Instead of staying at Fort Necessity and proving its defenses, Washington decides to take the offensive. He leads his Virginians northwest of Gist Mill, leaving McKay at the fort. Gist Mill was the first English settlement west of the Allegheny River. The 20-mile trek is arduous. The journey takes two weeks, and when Washington's men reach the small plantation, they find it swarming with Indians who had been sent to spy on the Virginians. The French are expecting them. Washington tries to convince the Indians to join his men in the half-king against the French, but it is useless. The Indians are more concerned with which side has the most men, and it certainly is not Washington's. He sets to work laying yet another road and building defenses around the mill. But when Washington learns that a force of 800 French and Canadians and 400 Indians are advancing, he calls for McKay to join him. Somewhat surprisingly, McKay does so promptly. Washington soon finds himself in a precarious situation. Realizing that a trek back across the mountain roads put him at a risk of an ambush. Washington nevertheless agrees with the half-king that returning to Fort Necessity will be their best chance for survival. He decides to decamp directly and to have her swivel drawn by the men by reason of the scarcity of horses. The journey back is worse than the trek to the mill. Washington's men have not eaten bread in six days, and none is forthcoming. After a tough two-day trek over the Allegheny Mountains, Washington's men arrive back at Fort Necessity. They're not encouraged by what they find. The expected reinforcements have not arrived, and the stores of food they hope to find turn out to be a few bags of flour. There's no time to rest. Washington's men begin shoring up Fort Necessity's defenses. Even McKay's men contribute to the work this time. Unfortunately, the defenses will not be ready before the French arrive. Washington admits that he has not the time to perfect the fortifications. Still, with no experience in fort building or siege tactics, Washington nevertheless thinks Fort Necessity is capable of withstanding an attack from 500 men. Unknown to Washington, the day after he had set off for Fort Necessity, the French had broken camp with a force of 600 French and Canadian soldiers, bolstered by some 100 Indians. It is smaller than what has been reported to Washington, but still much larger than his 400 sick and starving men. Leading the French force is Captain Louis Colon de Villiers, the older half-brother of the murdered Jumonville. Captain Villiers' quest for revenge is encouraged by his superiors, who order him to avenge ourselves and chastise them for having violated the most sacred laws of civilized nations. Back at Fort Necessity, Washington's Indians begin to worry about their plight. Those sent to reconnoiter the front become alarmed by the huge numbers of rival natives in the woods. Preparing to do battle, the Half-King encourages Washington to retreat farther south to Wills Creek, but this time Washington refuses. His men are in too wretched a condition for any more forced marching. Frustrated by the young officer's refusal to listen to his advice and not wanting to be on the losing side of a battle and possibly lose his own scalp, the Half-King leads his Indians out of camp. Around 9 a.m. on July 3, 1754, Washington gets word that the French are approaching. The men hasten their preparations as they begin loading their flintlock muskets and swivel guns. Washington's greatest fear is that the French will charge his entrenchments, as the French are armed with more bayonets than his men. He can only muster 300 men healthy enough to fight against some 700 of the enemy. Fully one-fourth of his men are too sick or exhausted to fight. All is silent in the surrounding forest as Washington's men rush to finish their entrenchments. Then, around 11 a.m., a lone sentry fires his musket into the woods. The Battle of Fort Necessity is on. The French, shouting and cursing, emerge from the woods. Washington sends his men out to form ranks. The French open fire and then turn about and retreat to the woods. Washington wisely holds his fire. The enemy's shots from roughly 600 yards away are ineffective. Colonel Washington quickly realizes that the French are not fighting by European rules. 
they have no intention of charging across open ground. Instead, the French are content to keep to the woods. Washington orders his men back to the trenches and gives the order to fire. His men open up with muskets and fire their swivel guns. Their fire, according to the commander, was done with great alacrity and undauntedness. The French continue the maneuver in the woods, looking for an area closer to the fort from which to attack. They find such a place 60 yards away and begin firing away. Next, the Indians attack. Again, Washington gives the order to fire and his men let loose another volley, stopping the Indians cold. The fighting degenerates into sniping by both sides. The French, Indians, and Canadian militiamen are difficult to spot. Washington's men return fire as best they can, using grape shot from the swivel guns. One company remains within the stockade, firing through the slits in the palisades. The French manage to surround Fort Necessity and concentrate their shots on anyone who raises above the battlements to return fire. Casualties begin to mount. Men are getting killed or wounded from both direct fire and balls ricocheting off the wooden palisade. Jagged wooden splinters explode from the walls, adding to the injuries. The French open fire on Washington's cattle and horses as well, killing most of the animals. It's another blow to the men's morale. Even if they outlast the French fire, they have nothing but a little flour to sustain them. The fire continues late into the afternoon, until storm clouds roll in and skies open up with a downpour. Trenches fill with water and rain soaks the ammunition and fire locks. There are only two screws for the Hulk regiment to clear wet charges in their muskets. Slowly, the fire from Fort Necessity begins to slacken. That night, a single French voice breaks the tension-filled silence, Volez vous parler? Or, would you like to talk? Washington refuses to respond, assuming the request is a ruse to get him to leave the safety of the trenches for no man's land between the fort and the forest. The request is once again repeated, and Washington eventually decides the request is a legitimate attempt to open negotiations. He sends two of his men into the middle ground, where they meet with a French delegation. The men return with two copies of a surrender document, both in French. One of the men, Jacob Van Bram, is Dutch but speaks French. He brings the documents to Washington and McKay. The documents are in terrible condition, water soaked and smeared with mud. Huddled over the documents in the leaky storehouse, Washington and McKay listen as Van Bram laboriously tries to translate over candlelight. Villiers' conditions are generous, considering the circumstances. They allow Washington's men to leave the valley in peace with any belongings they can carry with them. After thoroughly studying the surrender terms, Washington sends back the document to get Villiers to allow his men to leave with their weapons, as they will be traveling through hostile territory. Upon receiving Washington's response, Villiers easily runs a line through the sentence. He may have been surprised that Washington does not dispute an earlier line in the treaty in which the second line of the text, Villiers has written that the objective of his force has been only to revenge assassination which had been done to one of our officers. Basically, he's calling Washington a murderer. Nonetheless, Washington and McKay both sign it. Since McKay had not been with Washington at the ravine, it is only Washington who is admitting, albeit unknowingly, to the assassination of Jamonville. The next day, ironically enough the 4th of July, the French emerge from the woods following a beating drummer. Washington's men leave Fort Necessity, form up in line, and surrender to the French. The one day action at Fort Necessity exacts a heavy toll on Washington's command. He has lost 30 men killed and 70 wounded. By contrast, Villiers lost only two Frenchmen and one Indian killed and 17 wounded. Washington's men stay the night and begin marching home the next morning, carrying the wounded on their backs. The French put a torch to Fort Necessity before departing. The paltry symbol of British strength in the Ohio Valley, George Washington's first command post, burns to the ground. Upon his return to Virginia, Washington receives a cool reception from Dinwiddie. The governor now considers his young officer a liability. In a letter to the Crown, Dinwiddie explains that my orders to the commanding officer were by no means to attack the enemy till all the forces were joined. Dinwiddie hints that things might have gone better if he had led the expedition. The governor, however, has no more military experience than Washington and has no appreciation at all for conditions in the field. After criticizing Washington's performance, Dinwiddie turns around and orders Washington north again, but nothing comes of the order. 
The men of the Virginia militia are half starved, unpaid and practically naked after the recent excursion. Washington suggests that only a death penalty for desertion will keep his men in camp. Dimwitty, oblivious to the men's condition, tells Washington that any problem with his men comes for the want of proper command. Washington's surrender at Fort Necessity on July 4, 1754 has an immediate effect on relations between the British and the French. His alienation of the Indians causes almost all of them to side with the French. Now, they will harass any British farmers or traders in the Ohio Valley. Washington also jeopardizes Great Britain's moral claim to the New World by formally admitting to the assassination of a French officer. The French, who had captured Washington's journal after the battle, have it translated and printed in pamphlets that they distribute throughout Europe, claiming that the British have violently disrupted their peaceful occupation of the Ohio Valley and that George Washington is a self-confessed murderer. With the conflict in the Ohio Valley in North America now heating up, both Great Britain and France fight a series of campaigns in the New World before the British officially declare war on the French in 1756. In North America, the conflict will become known as the French and Indian War and become a struggle to determine the fate of who will control North America, the British or the French. The war will soon become just a theater of an even larger global conflict known as the Seven Years' War.